Well, thank you very much, first of all, for inviting me here to Ireland. I'm a, it's a great pleasure to be here on the Green Island. And my paper will be on a new or not so new anymore green industry. So that's kind of the connection, I, I hope, and I think. And the paper is, uh, my paper here is based on a, on a written paper with um, support by Richard Campos. So I want to base, uh, or I want to situate my paper within the context of the evolutionary economic, uh, evolutionary economic geography, so I'm here, and the perspective of that um, theoretical strand is the co-evolution of industries and institutions. And what we see in that um, theory is that they have a focus on past dependency, on clusters or on inertia, as we just said, and uh, lock-ins and the associ associated institutions which stabilize um, existing structures. And what I want to show is that the wind industry is an example of what Graham Martin would call an on-past development, which is a past-dependent development, but it is not a cluster, uh, an example for, it's not a cluster story. And we, what we see in the wind industry is that small and incremental changes lead to fundamentally new structures, which is something the um, um, evolutionary economic geography not really embraces uh, wholeheartedly. Um, also, the change in, in this theory focuses on innovation and, innovation and learning as endogenous drivers of change. And what I want to show is that as a wind industry, that politics and public policies drive this industry development and its locational structure as exogenous um, factors. And what I want to argue is that we need to better integrate institutions at multiple levels. Um, into, into, into evolutionary thinking and that we might need to look at institutions beyond the local production context. This is the outline of my paper with the wind industry and its development um, stages. I will then want to look at the localization of the industry and public policies and I want to close with a very, very brief discussion and conclusion. First of all, um, what we see here is a newly installed capacity for annual wind power development. We see that this is a very, very steep curve, and it has resulted in the emergence and the very, very fast growth of a new industry due to demand-side renewable energy policies. Um, here is one of the results. We see here the wind share of total electricity consumption in the EU countries. And two of the pioneer countries of the wind industry are the blue, blue arrows here, that's Denmark and Germany, with fairly high shares of electricity consumption already provided by wind energy, 10% and even 24% in Denmark, which is a smaller country. Follow-up countries have been Portugal and Spain, with also very high shares of um, wind energy in their consumption pattern. And interesting enough, just for the idea Ireland, Ireland is also very high on that list without being one of the main um, production locations for the wind industry, which is the case for all the other four I mentioned already. So, um, what type of policies are these which have promoted that kind of development? There's public policies and support schemes which promote renewable energies, and the background is climate change and, and, and environmental policies. This could be mandatory renewable energy targets, feed-in tariffs, which have been very important in Germany and uh, at some time in Denmark, but also in, in Spain and, and Portugal. Um, quotas and certificates, which are more um, prominent in the Anglo-Saxon world, government tendering in some countries, and also financial and tax incentives. And the interesting thing about this is that these types of politics and policies have been diffused or transferred from one country to another as best practice um, um, thing. <coughs> They are driving, these kind of policies are driving the industry development, not only in Europe, but also elsewhere. But here first, again, um, the market shares in, in Europe, the EU member state market shares for total is soil capacity, and we see that those countries which have high shares of um, electricity coming from wind and are large countries are also the major markets for wind turbines, which is um, Germany and Spain, whereas Denmark and Portugal as small countries are not as important as markets, and the same is true also for Ireland. Um, if we now look at countries beyond Europe, we see that there are some new countries coming up as very, very important market for wind turbines and for wind energy. And the most important one is China, and this, uh, this figure is from 2010. 
And the latest figure of 2011 is that China is now the most important market for wind turbines worldwide. So we have high growth rates, we have an internationalization of demand due to the diffusion of renewable energy policies worldwide and also the internationalization of the industry and that's what I want to look at more closely now. The structure of the industry as it is depicted here is a very recent development. We see that it's a very, very complex industry with many different parts and what I want to, um, a GPN as you can say, a global production network that involves many different types of activities from planning, financing, to turbine production, which is um, what I have circled here and what will be the focus of my paper, to the, main, to the operation of the turbines on the ground, the maintenance and also the planning and that kind of stuff. So there's um, the wind industry itself in the narrow sense that I want to look at, which is turbine production, and then there's the various service providers surrounding that type of industry, plus, and I want to look at those a little later, the institutional actors, which are very important to understand what is happening here. But um, how did we get to this kind of um, complex global production network, this complex structure? Um, it's a good example of past dependent development of an industry, and we need to look back to very early, um, to very early um, development, which goes back to last, no, not last century, but the 19th century. Well, I think the modern wind industry started in the 60s and 70s with pioneers that were active mainly in Denmark, in Germany, and also the US. Very small farmers and uh, engineers, which were kind of developing the first small wind turbines. Um, then this was picked up by, uh, by states by, in, uh, against the background of the oil crisis. Large state-funded R&D projects tried to develop really large wind turbines. And I have an example of the federal state um, R&D expenditure in the energy sector in Germany. And what we see here, the yellow is the renewable energy uh, expenditures, and they're very low compared to all the other things. But what we see here in the in this, in this late 70s and early 80s as a um, consequence of the oil price shocks, is the money that was put into the development of a very, very large wind turbine, which then um, failed. And we had a similar development in, in the US, which also failed. Um, then we see it's fairly stable. We had Chernobyl in 86. This is kind of shifted a little bit to the right. And then in 1990 and 2000, we had federal acts which promoted renewable energy against the background of a very large sensitivity to energy issues in Germany and the phasing out of nuclear energy that was, um, yeah, that was kind of uh, starting to happen in Germany. And whereas other, um, other state funding for research and development in the energy sector was going down, um, renewable energy would at least keep stable and has gone up in the last years, especially with a new, um, uh, new decision to phase out energy eventually now, last year. Okay, so these projects um, failed though, the development of a very large wind turbine. At the same time though, in, mainly in Denmark, but a little bit also in Germany, and the Germans then moved back to Denmark later on, we had a step-by-step -step improvement of wind turbines, and this was much more successful than the large state funded projects that we had. And in the 90s, when there was this legislation in Germany and also a support for renewable energy, <coughs> energy in Denmark, we saw, and also the California market developed very well, these small companies that had been developing into SMEs and uh, gradually grew larger um, had a real boom and there was also a consolidation of the industry and we saw other countries that uh, developed to be production uh, locations for the wind industry and that was mainly the US but also Spain. And um, soon, soon enough, in the last 10 to 15 years, also India and China developed to be um, countries where wind energy played a major role and where also production facilities were located. Um, as I already said, it started out with farmers and entrepreneurs with very small turbines, went over to SMEs, which kind of survived the period when the large state funded projects failed. They became globally active firms when the demand grew very quickly due to the demand side policies that I already um, mentioned. And it ended up to be multinational firms which had these global production networks, which I already showed here. What we saw altogether is that we had a continuous expansion of the wind industry and also of the wind industry firms um, with respect to size, to organization, and also with respect to geography. 
Here we can see um, the size development, and if you want to know what a large wind turbine looks like, like today, and 5 megawatt is not the largest you get, it's 7.5 or even larger than that. It has a um, diameter that is larger than a football field or soccer field. So this is what large wind turbines look today. They're much larger than the ones they were aiming at in the state funded projects in the 70s and the 80s, but at that time they failed. Um, so, what we see is development from pioneers and SMEs in the north, the global north, and the question or the development that I would, um, would see in the future is to large multinational firms and global production networks that are mainly based in the south, in the south, in the global south. And I want to illustrate this by looking at the top 10 um, wind turbine producers worldwide and how, they, how, they, how we can see a shift here. In 1998, it was still mainly European countries that would dominate the wind turbine market. In 2004, there was already one Indian company, which was Suzlon. And now in 2010, we already have four companies from China, from China, which are among the largest, the 10 largest wind turbine producers worldwide. And the development seems to be going more and more into that direction. So, and this locational shift reflects the demand situation on one hand, but it also um, reflects different types of um, public policies that we see. And I already talked about the demand-oriented renewable energy policies and in the research project that I draw on here, we looked at Germany, Denmark as a really the pioneer countries, as Spain and Portugal, which were early followers and also um, have su substantial um, production facilities, and then the latest addition has been China. And we see that all of them have demand side policies which increase demand very, very heavily in the, over the last 20 or 10 or 5 years. But what is um, even more important when we look at the lo localization of those industries is not the market side, the demand side policies, but it is the supply oriented um, policies, the wind industry, industrial policies, which, first of all, very, very important for those countries that were not the early pioneers, is local wind content requirements, which were used to build up the wind industry both in Spain and in Portugal, and which is an instrument that China has used and only, only abolished, I think, about one year ago from, from, from now. So, but there were also other types of industrial direct policies influencing the, the location of these industries, which are financial and tax incentives for, for um, establishing plants, Customs duties and tariff protect protection for um, parts that are um, produced at home. Export credit assistance and quality certification were in instruments that were very important for Dan Denmark and Germany, which has very, very important exports of wind turbines now. More than 80% of the production in those two countries is now exported to other countries. And R&D policies also play an important role in a very new development in China. And we have heard a lot about China today. I mean, what China is trying to do now with respect to the wind industry as well as to other industries is to link itself into global innovation networks. And they were quite successful, for example, buying engineering companies in Germany and trying to get the technology via um, joint ventures with companies that have to locate in China to be able to do to, to um, to cater the local market in that country. So, and what is interesting is that Spain and Portugal were the first to use local content requirements and successfully made large companies locate their production facilities there. Spain was even able to, to build up their own um, own company, Spanish companies, and I will show that later. And and China kind of copied some of those policies and was also very successful with it. So energy and industrial policies together were important for the local localization of the wind industry. And a very extreme case, and I mentioned it a few times, is Spain, actually. Spain, as I showed in the very beginning, is one of the largest and most dynamic markets for wind turbines at the moment. And we find a lot of different, all these signs depict um, production facilities that are important for producing manufacturing wind turbines turbines, generators, blades, gearboxes, there's many different parts that have to come together to make a wind turbine work in the end. And we see that many different companies have more than one location in their country. Axiona, a Spanish company. Alstom, French. Um, GE Wind, American. Vestas, Danish. Um, Anacom, German. 
Agamesa, the Spanish company, very intelligent strategy. It used to be a joint venture with Vestas, a Danish company, and then um, they kind of got the technology from Vestas, and then Vestas was uh, yeah, pushed out of that company, and now it's 100% Spanish again. So why did we get that funny picture with all these different locations, even on one company? Well, in Spain, we have an example of regional industrial policy. So each region that was had government tendering for wind parks would require uh, localization of manufacturing and value added, added value in that region. So that's why you find that it must be a profitable business because all these companies can kind of go to all these different places to have added value in different uh, different regions to be able to, to bid in those government tendering things. So now I come to my discussion. So what are the policy fields that are relevant for the wind industry and its localization? And I was mentioning on two, but there's more than that. First of all, on a regional or even local level, we have planning policies and regulations that are important for where am I allowed to put a wind turbine physically on the hill, near to a to a village or a town or whatever. Then we have the already mentioned renewable energy policy and support schemes, which kind of drive the demand for wind turbines and are very, very important. But then when it comes to localization, we have the industrial policy, which is important for the turbine production, which is here on the left-hand side. And at the same vein, especially if you want to be an innovative company and if you want to have um, domestic companies in the wind industry, you have to also look at research and innovation policy, which is what China is just starting right now in this area. So what we see is that we have a global production, we have global production networks in the wind industry with many different types of actors, and there's a very, very, very high relevance of public policy in various fields. Um, and at different levels to understand the development of this industry and of, of, um, of wind parks. So to come uh, to my conclusion, the perspective that I took was the co-evolution of a new industry and the institutions that are beyond local production contexts, which are often seen as stabilizing certain structures. Instead, we saw that in the wind industry that politics and public policies drive the um, development of this industry and also its uh, locational structure. And we see here an example how um, politics can effectively support the development and the evolution of a new industry in certain locations. And we see that renewable energy policy is a driver plus industrial policy which is influencing or maybe even determining the localization of that industry and resulting in those glo complex global production networks where we have the flows of goods, services, capital and knowledge, and the localization is governed by the transfer and diffusion of policies and policy models. And um, what I want to argue for is that we need to better integrate political agency and, and also learning in the field of policy, learning from each other, in this case mainly national policies, into evolutionary thinking to explain past dependent development beyond lock-in as we have it in the wind industry. And the wind industry, I think, is a good example for on past development and where small and incremental changes have led to fundamentally new structures. And the really interesting question these days is, in my mind, that we see somehow an example for a beginning or maybe also well, a, a continuing north-south shift of industry and maybe also political power in the long run. Okay, thank you very much.